and open up to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, and then let's read verses 13 through 18, you know, Kenton taught through 13 through 15 last week, we'll, we'll go over those verses again, just for the flow, let me go ahead and read that for us. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. I've titled this, The, the Heart of eschatology because really the main thing to take away besides the informative aspect Paul talks about I want you don't want you to be uninformed but the, is the comfort each other with those words as they exhort each other and that's the goal really of this this eschatology that Paul is is bringing uh, the word of the Lord to the Thessalonians. And we've talked about eschatology. I'm going to read some verses from the Thessalonians. But really, uh, the hope of eschatology is, is, I'm realizing more as we study this, is um, really a non-negotiable for the Christian. It's something that is, at least in my thinking, neglected quite a bit in the sense of, I don't always daily think about eschatology or think about the, the culmination of history and where everything's headed and eschatology really brings the reality of the future into the present and then we in the present as our witness function of the church that's a demonstration uh, that of what is going to come that there are our sanctification all these things in us of what we do and exist as as the church is proof that that is going to take place and so that really pervades uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, let me reread a few verses from or actually let's reread a few of them together from uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, can, can one of you read uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 going back earlier yeah, go ahead. It says, and to wait for his son from heaven, who will be raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay. And then there we go. Could you do 2.12? Thessalonians 2.12. This one's eschatological, but it's a little bit, you know, it could be taken that other way, too. But go ahead. Um, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Okay. So the kingdom and glory there. Um, the, the culmination of that is in is what we're headed toward. We're experiencing aspects of that now. And then Danny had read about that the life of the Christian is to wait from his son from heaven who rescues us from the wrath to come. And then I'll read 219 where he says of the Thessalonians, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of of our Lord Jesus at his coming. And really that idea of the presence of that, that's the kind of main idea of that there's going to be this eternal um, new reality of Christ's presence with his people in a unique way. And then uh, 3.13 says, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father in the coming or the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. So this is something that's going throughout Thessalonians of what they're, they're headed toward and need to know. And so it, it really drives sanctification, it drives these other realities as well. And so the church has always been, and, and rightly so, or it ought to be forward-looking, 
in the sense of history, that promise of the culmination of our hope in the return of the Lord. And I'd have to read a little bit more on this, but it's kind of interesting to think through, you know, when Paul says, but uh, we who are alive and remain and talking about that, it doesn't necessarily mean that Paul thought, okay, I'm definitely going to be here for this, this event, that I'm still going to be alive. But uh, you can see, and I was looking at, you can see kind of throughout the letters of Paul, like Titus, he talks about the, not the rapture exactly, but the, the final return, the second coming, calls it the blessed hope and appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ in uh, Titus 2.13, and in 2 Timothy he also talks about the, you know, at the end of his life he talks about um, his, his death and he talks about the, the return of the Lord. Uh, in Philippians he talks about um, that he, he would rather uh, die and go to be with the Lord, but also, you know, remain on. So it's kind of interesting to see and think through the Thessalonians is an early letter to see even Paul's change in his thinking of, yeah, I'm probably going to die and be with the Lord, and that's actually what I'd rather do. Rather, you know, so just seeing how it, uh, things kind of develop with him over time. So he thought, you know, he may be here for this event, he may not be, uh, but all believers are going to experience, whether dead or alive, uh, at that time, are going to experience that eschatological event of the, the final glory of God in the person of Christ and his reign. And so that's what we're looking forward to. And so here Paul adds some understanding to that event, that the living and dead believers uh, are going to participate in that, in that culmination of those things, that glorious appearing, um, and that final reign of the Lord Jesus. And Kenton talked about that as in relation to the, the dead believers, the believers who have already died, what's their state? What's, are they going to be able to participate in this? And so Kenton taught on that last week. I'd just like to draw our attention real quick, j just in some review, to verse 15, because there's some tie-ins here, uh, and, and really just to focus in on the first part, was, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now there's some debate about that, of what that means, whether Paul's bringing in new revelation, which I believe that he is, uh, or whether he's referring to, so the Lord Jesus already said this, like in Matthew 24, is he referring to that um, set of statements by Jesus, or is he referring to something that Jesus said in his earthly ministry that isn't written in other places in Scripture? Or is Paul referring to something else as in the Lord has given him new revelation to give to the church? And I think that's the, that's the case. But even this, uh, this usage of the word of the Lord um, is used elsewhere in uh, Thessalonians. And it talks about in Thessalonians 1.8 that the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you and has gone to all these other places. And the Gentiles have, have heard of it. And so this kind of ties in some themes of, of eschatology from, uh, from an Old Testament book. Can uh, one of you read Isaiah 2, 1 through 4? And we'll look at some, some themes there. Just, it, it also repeats the phrase, word of the Lord, and, or word of Yahweh. Right, 2, 1 through 4? Yeah. <clears throat> the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It came to pass in the latter days that the mountain, excuse me, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke, and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, they shall, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations, nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more anymore. Yeah, so that's one of the hope passages in Isaiah, of a dense uh, prophecy of 
once the Lord reigns on the earth, this will be the, the result. And we're still looking ahead to that. Now, some would say that's a spiritual thing, that it's only going to be recognized or, or accomplished spiritually, but uh, the way Isaiah writes is, is with regard to history. Um, but there's some uh, things that I would draw our attention to. It says, now this will come about in the last days, which if we're paying attention to or remembering Acts and, you know, that we're going through on Sunday mornings, in Peter's sermon, he quotes when, when the Holy Spirit comes and comes on the church at Pentecost, which is the, the feast of the first fruits, which meant the, the feast of the first fruits was that more was going to come, and that's kind of why the Holy Spirit uh, comes and kind of presents the church at that time. And Peter preaches out of Joel and says, this is that which is spoken of the prophet Joel and talks about in the last days. And he, he uses that phrase to say, this is the, the category of history that we have now stepped into that precedes the, the second coming, the reign of the Lord. So that's what Isaiah is referring to as well that the house of God will be established, the mountain of the Lord will be established above all these hills. This mountain is going to kind of fill the earth. Um, and it says, and then, now think of the, the Thessalonians as kind of a mix of mainly Gentile believers with some Jews and, and those who knew the Old Testament. It says, and all the nations are going to stream to it, so that the church is representing that now as Gentile believers who believe in, in Christ. Um, and then the law is going to go forth from Zion. And then notice in uh, Isaiah 2, 3, the end of it, it's, it uses that same phrase, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So when Paul, and there, there are other places in the Old Testament that this could have been taken from, but Paul is, is tying in that language a little bit probably with the Old Testament as well and saying this is the word of, of Yahweh, and, and, and he's referring to um, that Old Testament sense and, and bringing it now to apply to to Jesus and saying, okay, we're, we're pulling forward the theology of Isaiah, of the Old Testament, about, uh, about eschatology, about the final victory of God in the world, uh, that that's all coming together now. And now he's going to add new information about this event. He's going to kind of zoom in the telescope or the microscope and show a different aspect of this um, event. Uh, something also just to take note of in Isaiah 2.8 um, is that it's, it speaks about the, the world at that time, during Isaiah's time and, and even now, is the world is filled with idols. He says the world is full of idols. In Isaiah 6, which is the, you know, Isaiah's famous vision, it says the, which is a, a prediction of the final goal, it says the earth is full of God's glory. So the, there's a difference there in the idols being replaced with, with God's glory. Eventually the earth is going to be filled with God's holiness uh, and God's glory rather than being filled with idols, which also you know, has some tie-in with Thessalonians as well because they turned from idols to a living and true God. And so Paul is saying, he's saying, okay, here's the word of the Lord. We're moving... History is progressing, theology is progressing forward, and these truths are coming uh, to be. They're, they're being seen in kind of a seed form in the church, in kind of a first fruits form in the church, and that more is going to come. And he gives them this, this more information about uh, this, this episode of the second coming, or this episode or event of the, the day of the Lord, or the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord and says there's some more details, or in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a mystery about this that you need to know, meaning something that was not revealed, but now is going to be revealed, and mystery in the New Testament and the Old Testament um, means kind of like the, if it was like a movie or something, it's kind of like the unlocking secret that, that, puts everything in its place. That's kind of the idea of mystery, like the church is a mystery. The, um, this aspect of the return of the Lord is a mystery. Daniel uses it and speaks of mystery um, that way. Um, but so some points here just to look at, and we'll go through these uh, fairly briefly because it's, it's fairly 
simple. There's not too much to it. But I want us to think through some of this um, interpretational uh, stuff and, and why um, we believe or our church would teach this a certain way and other Bible-believing Christians would uh, understand these texts differently and to see that discussion a little bit and, and think through it together. But uh, I've just put some words here for this event that Paul describes of the rapture, or the, the, this aspect, I'll say, of the return of the Lord. Because I used to get um, bothered by when people would say, well, the Lord could return at any time. And I, I think that was, is partially right, because this is not exactly the return of, of Christ, right? Because he's not coming to earth and, and a bunch of things like this. But, but, it's the, but now I, I kind of understand it as this is the uh, part of the beginning of that overall event. I don't know. What do you guys think? Because, you know, when people say, well, the Lord could return at any time, it's like, well... Yeah, but I mean, if we believe that there's going to be a preceding events before the second coming, there's there's more time than just Christ is going to show up and it's all done, right? Um, so I, I don't know, maybe, well, should we be more careful about that language? I don't know, what do you guys think when we talk about this as the return of the Lord? It's the return of the Lord for his people, right. but I don't know if... Yeah, I, maybe you call it the rapture of the church yeah, or something. Exactly. Are you just precision is is kind of the word of the day because right if people think he's going to come back to judge at any time in the sense of like you were saying the full day of the Lord that whole event which does include both blessing and but mm-hmm. also judgment but if they mean the rapture not the left behind kind of weird rapture but a biblical rapture, yes, indeed, he could return, and it says later, like a thief. So, just to be yeah. So, I mean, that's something to think through. I was thinking um, a book I read and probably never completed was John MacArthur's book on the Second Coming, and because the people who are in our camp of thinking on this this issue would say, you know, use the word imminent, it could happen at any time. And aspects of it are, are imminent, um, but some of it is, is not imminent. It takes, you know, it takes place within a certain set of events and things like that. So anyway, but that's just my own um, kind of just trying to think through the words and things that we use on the, these events. Okay, but here's a set of words for us to, to kind of outline this. So the return for Jesus here for his people um, and the t- aspects of it are put one are really personal it's distinct what Paul is describing here it's immediate it is permanent and then it's actionable so it dis- it's personal it's distinct immediate permanent and actionable and so Paul is, is given this information about a new aspect. It wasn't new to the Lord, but new to believers about what was going to take place with the church. And that's actually appropriate, I think, because the church itself, for uh, Ephesians 3, is a mystery. That the church would be, that the gospel would go to the Gentiles and all that stuff. That that was something that was, I mean, it was always known that the Gentiles would be part of the saving work of God, but that there would be this unique um, working of God and this mystery called the church was was something that was revealed. So it's only appropriate that that the aspect of the second coming, which is all over the Old Testament, also has this unique um, kind of distinct area for the church itself, that it is also a mystery that's, that's revealed during this time. But let's look at these things. So let's look at the personal... So this is to zoom in just a little bit on some words here. But notice in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. You guys remember memorizing this in Sparky's, I think, (laughs) when we were in Awana? And and I think our version said that the trump of God, when we we did it, I think we either did the King James or New King James. But anyway, but I would focus in on that, you know, that this is a personal 
return of Jesus for his, his people. And what's exciting about this in, in another way also, this is just a, maybe an apologetic side note, but um, in terms of the deity of Christ, this is a very early book written by Paul, and he's, he's, all throughout the book, Jesus is called the Lord, and so the Lord's return and the day of the Lord, which are Old Testament ideas, they're now being brought in, and, and Paul is saying that that is in the person of Jesus. Uh, so, uh, but what he focuses in on here is this is very personal. It's not just that the Lord sends angels for his people. It's not that the Lord were just instantly um, placed into heaven, although there's that kind of aspect there. It's that the Lord himself is, is taking action. You know, the Lord is on his throne at the current time, and he actually gets up and, and rises and, and descends to, uh, to do what is, is written here, what is taking place uh, here in this, this event in Acts 7, when Stephen is uh, being put to death by stoning it, it describes Jesus as standing at the right hand of the glory of God, which is, so uh, otherwise in the Bible it refers to him as seated at the right hand of God. So, but that, that standing kind of to, uh, for a couple of reasons, but one, to, to welcome Stephen in, um, you know, it's kind of akin to this here, that the Lord is, himself is going to come, that he's going to descend for his people. Last week, Kenton, I think, had us read this. Can somebody read John 14, 1 through 3? I think this highlights a little bit of the, yeah, thank you, of the personal aspect of, of this. This is another text that describes this. Okay. Do not let your heart be troubled. troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so there again, Jesus comforts his people, his disciples, the night before he's crucified with this truth. Uh, there is a place that I have for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That, that we will be, again, and this is what Paul echoes, and there we will be with the Lord. And so that, that personal aspect, that comforting personal aspect that Jesus is going to come, uh, come get his people and, and bring them to be, uh, to be with him. And really that aspect of, you know, that's what, what heaven is, is, is being with Christ. And as we end uh, this section in 17, or Paul ends, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And there won't, won't be that separation, but we'll look at that a little bit more depth later. But, you know, that's really the essence of heaven, is, is being with Jesus, not about necessarily all the details, of which Scripture gives us some, but heaven is about being with Jesus is this personal aspect of it here. Now it was always personal. The Lord was always going to return. There's going to be this unique um, personal action of the Lord for, uh, for his people, the believers on earth at that time. And so this, this creates in us a hope of uh, and a sense of expectancy of, of what is, could happen and could come at any time. Either it's a matter of time before we die and we'll be with the Lord, or this could occur at any time, which, uh, honestly, I used to uh, be afraid of just because I was wanting to not miss out on certain things about life. And, and that was, you know, okay as far as it went as a, as a kid but just not understanding those things. But um, I used to be afraid of the, the doctrine of the rapture and things like this. And I remember reorganizing our tapes in here for, you know, in our entertainment center 
and not that this is the, the Bible or anything by any means, it, it has all kinds of weird problems with it, but I took the left behind tape and put it in the very bottom corner and then, you know, buried it under all the other VHS tapes because I didn't want anybody to, my parents to suggest when I, hey, let's, let's watch this or we'd go to movies and they, I would be afraid that there would be a movie, a preview even in there about the Antichrist or about the rapture. And it just, I don't know, it just weirded me out or freaked me out. And um, I didn't want the Lord to return. I, you know, I don't know if I was saved at the this when I was a lot younger. Uh, probably then when I was hiding the tape, but um, now I'm scared of it for different reasons. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I eventually got over that as a teenager. Uh, but just the aspect now, I think, um, that the Lord could take us out of here at any time and that sanctification would be complete at that time and we would leave this world behind. Now there are a lot of things I enjoy about life here, but it's just, I wouldn't be complaining to, the, you know, wouldn't be a, an issue anymore now. Just uh, just thinking about that, it's kind of like, I don't know, it, now this life is more like, okay, you're, you know, we're occupying ourselves for, <laughs> with things. Uh, and, and then waiting for something better to get there. It's kind of like when you're, you're a kid and you're, you know, doing stuff kind of to fill time before grandma gets there. And then as soon as grandma gets there, you're like, okay, I'm done with this covering book or whatever. I'm like, it was fun, but I don't want to just sit there and, and do that now. Um, but just that, that personal return of the Lord at, uh, at any time, you know, that should create in us that sense of uh, suspense, a godly suspense and um, an expectancy. And this is what Paul is writing about to them because in that, like we talked a little bit about this last week, that it can create in people if, uh, if you have a misunderstanding or an unbalanced, imbalanced thinking on eschatology or anything really, it can create different problems. One can be anxiety, like worrying about okay, well, that's good for us, but what about the believers who have already died? Are they going to participate in the glorious appearing and the second coming of Christ? Well, the answer is yes, so it could create anxiety. But it could also create idleness, and that comes up in um, more in Second Thessalonians, but in here too, you see it as well, that, well, if the Lord's going to return uh, tomorrow, then, you know, why worry about being too careful about work or things like that, you know, just, it's not that big of a deal, or planning ahead or things of that nature, so it can create idleness, it, but Paul is saying you shouldn't have either of those, you should have peace and that we comfort each other with these words and we don't grieve without hope like the rest do, who have no hope, and so we have that peace, but we also have this, this godly expectancy that, the, that we don't know the day or the hour, we don't know when, when this event could take place, so there should be a, an excitement or a readiness um, for those things, and that that, that Christ is going to personally uh, come to to receive us, come to to get us, um, and that that, and then after that, with, briefly after that, we will participate in um, His final victory on the earth and His reign on the earth. Um, what about you guys? When you guys were growing up, did you guys, uh, I, I didn't say anything about that as a kid because I felt bad about being scared about the rapture, so I didn't say anything about it to like adults or other friends or things, I just tried to avoid the subject. But uh, did you guys think about that as a kid or do you have bad, not bad thoughts, but just deficient thoughts about the rapture or, or uh, things, you know, you just maybe it bothered you, maybe it freaked you out, I don't know, as a kid, or, or what it, <laughs> or... Well, deficient, sure, like your wrong views about it. For me, it was mostly like that left, whole left behind thing, which was popular in my mm -hmm. day, I don't know, but there was the imagery of like, someone's clothes just sitting there, empty, all laid out perfectly, that whole thing. And it was more of like, oh, am I going to be part of the rapture or not and stuff. And like you, it was, I wasn't saved when that was, when that movie came out or whatever, in the 90s or something. 
So that was the, the cause of it. But yeah, it was mostly that, like, who, what, what if I'm left behind in the rapture kind of nonsense. Yeah, that was kind of mine too. Like, I've wondered that as well. Like, like I wasn't, I wasn't, I, yeah, I was scared, or I was scared of like the Antichrist or like that type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, are we left behind? It's like, wow, it's just everyone's gone one day and it's me by myself. You're same, I don't think I was saved at the time either. So it's like, so that would be a scary thing then. Yeah. Yeah, so, and we, I think lots of Christians have had, uh, had that thought, you know, if, if they're in the kind of dispensational camp that believes in the rapture like that. But, um, Okay, let's look at the next part, the distinct. The, the, this is distinct. And let me, um, this is where I think we should have a little more discussion here. Some think, uh, and they have reasonable reasons for thinking that what Paul's describing here is a reiteration of the return of Christ described in the events of like Matthew 24 where Jesus is talking about the judgment of, of the world and his return and, and the events that precede that and, and all those things and it is a it has a surface validity and it has a compellingness to it because it mentions trumpets mentions Jesus coming to earth it mentions gathering people it mentions you know a lot of this stuff that you know, why add this extra um, event, you know, called the, the rapture that happens before, and, and, and not just say, look, it all happens at this one time when, when Christ comes, we're going to be, yes, we're going to be with him, we're going to participate in his, his judgment and reign. So there are other believers who are um, our friends and brothers and sisters who uh, think differently about these things. And I'll be honest, now, a lot of earlier um, Christian writers and teachers um, did have a kind of premillennial view of, of kind of, you know, similar to what our church would teach. But uh, throughout church history, most of them have not um, held to the, this distinct kind of uh, way of thinking about this passage. Now, we all want, you know, want to take the Word of God seriously. Um, let me read real quick. Uh, from the Reformation Study Bible, uh, and I, R.C. Sproul edited this, so I don't know if these are his his words, um, but just someone from like his position, what they would think on this, and let's talk about those those differences and talk about maybe how we could explain that to someone or or answer questions here in regard to this. But let me try to find. Okay. So he has a little section here in a, you know, in a box uh, about the return of Christ. So let me read it and kind of give you a position from, the, from someone from the other side who takes the Bible um, seriously like we do, believes the gospel, but then you know, believes differently on this matter. So let me read on the box of the return of Christ. So the New Testament repeatedly announces that Jesus Christ will one day return. His second coming or presence, Greek parousia, will be a royal visit. Christ's return will be personal and physical, visible and triumphant. At the second coming, Jesus will bring an end to history. He will raise the dead and judge the world, and impart to God's children their final glory. Paul says that Christ will then hand over the kingdom and become subject to the Father. In saying this, Paul does not mean that Christ is reduced in honor, but that he will have completed the plan of God assigned to him for redeeming the elect. In heaven, the elect will honor the Lamb who opened the book of God's salvation. According to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, Christ's coming will be a descent from the sky, heralded by a trumpet, a shout, and the voice of an archangel. Those who have died in Christ will be raised, and Christians living on earth will be caught up to meet Christ. This event will mark the end of life in this world as, uh, as we have known it and the beginning of unbroken communion with God. The idea that Christians will be taken out of this world for a period after which Christ will appear still a third time for the second coming uh, 
has been widely held but regard uh, lacks scriptural support. Okay, so that's re- everything they said pretty much is, if not identical, it's, it's very similar to what we believe until that point. The New Testament specifies that much will take place between Christ's two comings. However, apart from the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, these predictions are ongoing processes rather than single events and do not yield even an approximate date for Jesus' reappearance. The Gentile world will be summoned to faith and Jews will be brought into the kingdom, Romans 11, 25-29, a passage that may or may not anticipate a national conversion. There will be false prophets and false Christs. There will be an apostasy from the faith and tribulation for the faithful. A man of sin must appear. No dates can be deduced from these predictions. The time of Jesus' return remains completely unknown. Christ teaches that a tragic disaster uh, for anyone who is not ready when he returns. The thought of his return should be constantly in our minds, encouraging us in our present service and teaching us to live ready to meet Christ at any time. So the position of like the Reformation Study Bible and R.C. Sproul would be that there are these processes of events, you know, men of lawlessness throughout history could be all kind of coming together to be the Antichrist, that there's no one specific individual of the Antichrist, and so they would look at all kinds of different people throughout history and these events where the gospel's gone to the Gentiles. But basically their position is this. They believe in a rapture, but they believe it's going to be at the point when Christ comes again. It's just one it's just one event. Yeah, we come, he comes again, we're there with him, and then we come down and reign on the earth with him. That's that's it. Um, and so that's the that's the position. And it, you know, you could even ask, okay, well why uh, why not? It kind of makes sense in this, you know, in the area of why complicate it to say that there's going to be this rapture where we're going to be gone, and then there's going to be this intervening time, and then Christ is going to come again. Um, let's think through that a little bit. Uh, so, from what I read, like questions, comments, just thoughts on those things. Well, really, based on what you were just saying, you can kind of, maybe, sort of see what they're saying ish if you really squint when you read Matthew 24 and the Olivet of Discourse along with some of the epistle stuff. But really, man, when you go to Revelation and even the Old Testament, the prophets as well, the annual and the minor prophets. But with Revelation at the very least, if you just read that straightforward and clear and don't do this really loosey-goosey, symbolic or allegorical or spiritualizing of Revelation, it's just you have to deal with the details it gives and the timing that it gives and the exact events that it provides. Um, and it just doesn't, it's a major run, monkey wrench in that position. Um, and even in this text with the, them saying that the, there's like, how can there be a space in between where there, it's the separate thing between the rapture and the second coming, it's like a third coming thing that they're saying. It really doesn't take into account what, what Paul is bringing up later on with the day of the Lord. Mm. That is a really important thing and the, are the minor prophets really bring that up. It's not, a, it's really not a single 24 hour thing or even a single event. There's a lot going on in the day of the Lord. Right. Is, but anyways, so that's that's another thing that yeah, it's you can see where they're kind of getting it from, but it really isn't taking it into account all the scripture. Yeah. Other thoughts? All right. Yeah, another thing, I, I, I printed this out too, is, um, and this is John Calvin, this doesn't have to do with the rapture, but it does have to do with the um, literal interpretation of the Old Testament prophets. And it just goes to show, you know, just the, um, just the careful handling of scripture. 
that is that is necessary and that that even writers who are great don't always get it um, right but uh, for example this is John Calvin's commentary on uh, on Amos and I mean you guys know me I mean you know John Calvin is is uh, a commentator that I they I, I always read I think he's besides a scriptural interpreter like Jesus or Paul or Matthew or Peter, you know, I think he's the best, one of the best handlers of the Bible. And he's very careful. He's very literal. He wants, he, he believes the Bible is real history and all this stuff. But in Amos 9, it says that God, it repeats the history and the promises of Deuteronomy where God says, I'm going to plant you in the land. And he's speaking to Israel. And John Calvin recognizes in his time that's never happened. Israel's never occupied that area of land that's mapped out in the Bible. I mean, so what do you do with that? And to be sympathetic to, to him, a guy who's trying to handle the Bible, and there, there is no Israel. There are Jews, but they're dispersed, everyone, which is you know, kind of the point. They're in exile. Um, but so he, he, this is the one place um, in all of John Calvin's commentaries uh, where he, he uses this word elsewhere, but he actually uses it here to speak of, he says this has to be taken uh, allegorically. I mean, it has to be interpreted spiritually. He says, that, he goes, now if we look at uh, what happened afterwards, because they're saying, God says, I'm going to plant them in the land and they're going to have peace and they're going to have all these things. They're going to be under the reign of David, the Messiah, and all these things. And so he says, now if we look at what happened afterwards, it may appear that this prophecy has never been fulfilled. So he tries to reconcile that. Uh, he says, look, did God promise it? And he says, uh, basically, um, that it, it was a spiritual fulfillment in Christ and that this is allegorical language, not of the real world around us that we can touch and see, but uh, it's going to be a descriptor of a, more, of a greater spiritual reality. And so he says, if any objects and says that the prophet does not speak here or uh, allegorically, the answer is ready at hand, even this, that it, is a, it, that it is a manner of speaking everywhere found in scripture. He has a point. I mean, their scripture does use um, symbology, but that's not what's happening in the prophets. So it just it goes to show even, you know, people who we have great agreement with um, don't always get it right. Now, this is why I use the word distinct, uh, because the, it, it's not what Calvin says, or MacArthur says, or Sproul says, or, you know, and, and they would say that too. It's not about what they say. Um, we're all trying to handle the Bible carefully, but I would say that the details here and the dissimilarities between Matthew 24 make it obvious that this is a different event. Um, that because the words are, are specifically different, that's what makes it, um, that's what makes it a contrast. It would be like, I don't know, like what's a nursery rhyme or something that we learned as kids, like a poem or something like that. It would be like saying, Mary had a little, and you would want to say lamb, but I said dog. It would be, you know how I'm making a specific, you would recognize because you're hearing something familiar that I'm making a, a distinct um, statement. Mary had a little dog. And they were like, okay, that's clearly different. And it's different on purpose. That's what Paul's doing, uh, doing here. So here's some examples. Like, for example, Matthew 24, the context there is the judgment of the world. Um, here, there is no judgment. It's, it's about the gathering of believers. Uh, Matthew 24, there's a, there is a gathering, but it's a gathering of the people um, horizontally to one place on earth. Here, there's a gathering of people, but it's in the air. It's, in, uh, it's, it's a vertical gathering. It's not a gathering on earth, so it's, that's, a, that's a distinction. In Matthew 24, Christ comes down to earth, yeah, and that's the whole point. He sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. That's the um, that's very clear. Here, Paul makes it very clear. He's in the clouds. He doesn't come down to earth. So 
everybody's expecting, okay, when you talk about eschatology, you're talking about Christ coming and touch down on the earth. That doesn't happen here. And so Paul is, is making these clear differences in grammar and wording that show that this has to be a distinct event. So our, our position is um, correct because if you take the words and sentences uh, in carefully in their details and see their dissimilarities. Uh, so notice in verse 16, it's the Lord will descend from heaven. And then in verse 17, it's the, the, the meeting place is in the clouds. And then in verse 17 again, to meet the Lord in the air. And it doesn't ever talk about Jesus coming to, to earth there. So Paul makes it, this is a distinct episode. It is part of, I'll argue, it is part of the second coming or the day of the Lord overall. Uh, but, because like you said, the day of the Lord is not just one 24-hour period. It's, it's, it's a more... Uh, it's kind of an era, right, of, of event um, rather than a specific time. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of that process, but it's not, uh, it, it's not exactly the same as when Christ sets foot on the earth to reign. And so anyway, and there are all kinds of different positions on that too, that, that other people who are friends in the gospel hold. Um, some hold that Christ is he's already reigning now, that all this has already been fulfilled, and it's just a matter of you know, time. He's not going to reign on the earth physically. Uh, and all kinds of other things, but that's a discussion for another time. Okay, and then we'll move through these last couple points here. So then the next one, verse 17, is that it's uh, it's immediate. This is this can happen immediately at any time. And the word here, so have you guys ever heard the word rapture is not in the Bible? But it is in the Bible, actually. Um, it, now, the word Trinity is not in the Bible either, but, uh, but we don't just go by, okay, well, the, okay, here's the word there. Or, but it, actually, it is. Um, notice in verse 17, it's two words in English, but it says caught up. In Greek, that's the uh, Greek root word of harpazo, um, which means to be snatched away, to be brought somewhere, even, even suddenly, even violently. And... So that's the idea in where the word rapture comes from is the, the Latin translation and the Vulgate is, is rapturo, rapturos, um, and English that's just rapture. So it, it is in the Bible. Um, it's just a different Greek word. So it is there, that concept. So it's like some, I don't know how they get away with it biblically. Uh, I guess I'd have to ask, but some people are like, oh, well, we don't believe in the rapture. Because some people, like Christians, honestly believe we're, we're done for believing in the rapture. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, but it's, it's here. You can't get away from that. You will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. That's the, the timing or the exact nature of that I think you can debate. You know, but I, I don't know how you could get away with saying that it's not, not in the Bible. I mean, do you know? Because there are some people who are like preterists and think all kinds of things that are just, but it, it's there. So they make they, they make fun of us and they, they say, oh well, you're just a bunch of left behind people. Your philosophy of that came from the 1800s. It's new. It's, it's something the church has never believed, and and all this sort of thing. Um, but that's just to give us um, sort of a renewed confidence that taking the you know, the details of the Bible, we have a very strong case for, uh, for what we believe. Um, though it is, you know, admittedly, it does have difficulties with church history, but we don't go by church history authoritatively. Um, we do go by it in the sense of that, that we learn from it, but it is not, it's not authoritative as scripture is. Um, okay, so it's caught up, it, so it can, there's an immediacy there. And uh, this will be the first time I was realizing as I was studying this, that this will be the first time in history that the church is actually all together in one location. Because mm. we speak of the universal church on earth, we speak about our individual churches, we talk about the church you know, throughout uh, history, 
from Pentecost or the time of Jesus forward. And, um, but this is the time that the church is actually gathered as one in one place with the head of the church, with the Lord Jesus. And we're all together from then on as, as one. It's, it's never to be uh, separated again. So that'll, that'll take place. And it'll no longer just be churches anymore. It's just it's just us all together. Um, and the next point is that it's permanent. Verse 17. And so we shall always be with the Lord, or so we shall all forever be with the Lord. That this is the permanent um, state, and how Paul reassures them that the uh, from that point on will be in the eternal, glorious presence of the Lord Jesus. And our sanctification will be complete. Our holiness will be appropriate to the presence of the Holy One. And from that point on, we'll never be separated from uh, each other or from the Lord. And so this is that consummation of the work of Christ. And so even things like at the end of the Great Commission, it says in and thus or on lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age well now it's it, that is finally brought together in, in a uh, real time and space way we're, we're always with Christ uh, and this is even what Christ prayed in, in John uh, 17 24 that he said Father I desire that those whom you have given me may be with me where I am that they may see my glory the glory that you have given to me before the world was and so that was Christ's desire, and, and, and this is his uh, answered prayer of that his people be with him, but not only just hang out with him, but be with him to see his glory, and that the glory that the Lord had given him before the world was, that unique glory of, of Christ. Uh, and so Jesus desires us to, uh, to be with him at that, at that point. And so this is really also a test of uh, discipleship, you know, do we desire this? Why do we desire heaven? Uh, do we desire to be with the Lord? And this can also be something we can use in discipleship with uh, with others, is to say, you know, is their idea of what they're wanting and hoping in and hoping for in heaven that they get to be with the Lord? Um, it could be a test in a, uh, I'll say a more uh, challenging way of, okay, is this person really a believer? But it can also be a very comforting thing of, look, you know why there's not that much detail on heaven is because really the essence of it is, is thus we shall always be with the Lord. Um, and that's the main central idea of what heaven is. And then the last thing here um, is that it's actionable, or we could say that it's comforting. Um, comfort is, it's more the idea of exhort one another these words. It is comforting, like, makes us feel better, but, but even our English word comfort or, uh, comfort or when the Holy Spirit's referred to as comforter, it comes from a Latin uh, Greek word, uh, cum forte, which we remember from playing piano, the little F, the forte is something with power. It means to sit, you know, to um, exhort, to teach, to instruct each other with these words, not just to make people feel better, though that, that includes that, it's to comfort one another with uh, this truth, to drive on each other uh, with this truth. And that's really the heart, as I said earlier, the heart of eschatology is to comfort one another with these words, to encourage each other to be, uh, to be forward-looking. So it's not to create a chart of, okay, here's how it's going to work. Uh, and charts can be somewhat helpful. Um, but it's more to really get at the idea of comfort. Um, and I, I think of this with my, uh, I didn't really have a um, conversation with him about this topic, but uh, my uncle Ed, who we went to his funeral in Indiana, a uh, faithful preacher, but a um, pre-millennial, you know, post-millennial guy, uh, I believe, um, Baptist uh, minister. And so my uncle was saying that, you know, he, debating with him on this as a, uh, when my uncle was an older teenager, uh, a believer, but just an older teenager, and, and wanting to talk, you know, talk about coming from a premillennial and, and dispensational background to um, kind of post-millennial 
more reform background, and so they're, they're debating this. And uh, my uncle Ed just brought up that the, the purpose of this, that though they thought differently on those things, is um, is is this bringing together, therefore comfort one another with these words, and that that was the um, that was the main purpose. So just to encourage us not not to shy away from um, eschatology just because there is there is room for disagreement uh, and there there are believers who think differently than we do but it is so important I'm realizing through studying this book and um, and leveraging that for our sanctification um, I didn't realize I guess how much how necessary I think this was um, in, in understanding that future event and what that's going to entail for us uh, in our sanctification and what that means right now um, in, in the present for us. Because I always got the, oh, the Lord can return at any time, so don't be sinning when he gets here type of thing. But that that's not exactly what it's getting at. I think it's more the idea of um, our sanctification anticipates and uh, I think you said last week, Ab, ushers in that event, that, that we're, we're kind of welcoming that um, that final event and showing that it's going to happen through our sanctification, which gives us a bigger, a larger goal. Because just in our sanctification, we're not going to be like, oh, it's not a self-improvement thing. Like, we're just going to be able to make ourselves better. That's not going to have enough power for us to keep doing that for very long. Um, but to see that it's, it's really about showing the, the glory of what's coming in the future and taking that and bringing the future in now and now and seeing God's glory work uh, work in us. Um, so let's close in prayer and then we'll, we'll have some time to discuss and do some, some prayer requests as well. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you uh, for this truth. We thank you for the reality that history uh, is going to be all summed up in Christ. We ask for, and just I in particular ask for your forgiveness, Lord, for forgetting these things and for treasuring things in the world or sin, uh, whether neutral or sinful things, Lord. We just pray that uh, that you would continue to uh, cause us to look to this uh, this great hope and the blessed uh, appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord, and that that would be really the driving force um, of our lives, Lord, instead of getting so myopic and focused on uh, the here and now, let us focus on uh, the, the truth that we will always be with you at the, either our death or uh, at this event, Lord, whichever comes first, and help us to hasten on that, uh, that day, Lord, and to, uh, even now, as we finish up and have some time for application of these things, that we will make these things actionable and that these, uh, that we will comfort and exhort and encourage each other with these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.